Smith in the City by P. J. Wodehouse. One. Mr. Bickersdyke walks behind the bowler's arm. Considering what a prominent figure Mr. John Bickersdyke was to be in Mike Jackson's life, it was only appropriate that he should make a dramatic entry into it. This he did by walking behind the bowler's arm when Mike had scored ninety-eight, causing him thereby to be clean bowled by a long hop. It was the last day of the Illsworth cricket week, and the house team were struggling hard on a damaged wicket. During the first two matches of the week, all had been well: warm sunshine, true wickets, tea in the shade of the trees. But on the Thursday night, as the team champed their dinner contentedly after defeating the Incogniti by two wickets, a pattering of rain made itself heard upon the windows. By bedtime, it had settled into a steady downpour. On Friday morning, when the team of the local regiment arrived in their break, the sun was shining once more in a watery, melancholy way. But play was not possible before lunch. After lunch, the bowlers were in their element. The regiment, winning a toss, put together a hundred and thirty, principally due to a last wicket stand between two enormous corporals who swiped at everything and had luck enough for two whole teams. The house team followed with seventy-eight, of which Smith, by his usual golf methods, claimed thirty. Mike, who had gone in first as the star bat of the side, had been run out with great promptitude off the first ball of the innings, which his partner had hit in the immediate neighborhood of point. At close of play, the regiment had made five without loss. This, on the Saturday morning, helped by another shower of rain, which made the wicket easier for the moment, they had increased to a hundred and forty-eight. Leaving the house just two hundred to make on a pitch which looked as if it were made of linseed. It was during this week that Mike had first made the acquaintance of Smith's family. Mister Smith had moved from Shropshire and taken Illsworth Hall in a neighboring county. This he had done, as far as could be ascertained, simply because he had a poor opinion of Shropshire cricket, and just at that moment cricket happened to be the pivot of his life. My father, Smith had confided to Mike, meeting him at the station in the family motor on the Monday, is a man of vast but volatile brain. He has not that calm, dispassionate outlook on life which marks a true philosopher such as myself. I, I say, interrupted Mike, eyeing Smith's movements with apprehension. You aren't going to drive, are you? Who else? As I was saying. I'm like some contented spectator of a pageant. My pater wants to jump in and stage manage. He is a man of hobbies. He never has more than one at a time, and never has that long. But while he has it, it's all there. When I left the house this morning, he was all for cricket. But by the time we get to the ground, he may have chucked cricket and taken up the territorial army. Don't be surprised if you find the wicket being dug up into trenches when we arrive, and the pro moving in echelon towards the pavilion. No, he added as the car turned into the drive, and they caught a glimpse of white flannels and blazers in the distance, and heard the sound of bat meeting ball. Cricket seems still to be topping the bill. Come along, and I'll show you your room. It's next to mine, so that if brooding on life in the still hours of the night I hit on any great truth, I shall pop in and discuss it with you. While Mike was changing, Smith sat on his bed and continued to discourse. I suppose you're going to the varsity," he said. "Rather," said Mike, lacing his boots. "You are, of course. Cambridge, I hope. I'm going to King's." Between ourselves," confided Smith. I'm dashed if I know what's going to happen to me. I'm the thingamajiggy of what's its name. <laughs> you look it," said Mike, brushing his hair. "Don't stand there cracking the glass," said Smith. "I tell you, I'm practically a human three shies a penny ball. My father's poising me lightly in his hand, preparatory to flinging me at one of the milky cocos of life. Which one he'll aim at, I don't know." The least thing fills him with a whirl of new views as to my future. Last week we were out shooting together, and he said that the life of the gentleman farmer was the most manly and independent on earth, and that he had a good mind to start me on that. I pointed out that the lack of early training had rendered me unable to distinguish between a threshing machine and a mangel wurzel, 
so he checked that. He's now worked round to commerce. It seems that a blighter of the name of Bickersdyke is coming here for the weekend next Saturday. As far as I can say, without searching the Newgate calendar, the man Bickersdyke's career seems to have been as follows. He was at school with my pater, went into the city, raked in a certain amount of doubloons, probably dishonestly, and is now a sort of captain of industry, manager of some bank or other, and about to stand for Parliament. The result of these excesses is that my pater's imagination has been fired, and at the time of going to press, he wants me to imitate Comrade Bickersdyke. However, there's plenty of time. That's one comfort. He is certain to change his mind again. Ready? Then suppose we filter forth into the arena. Out on the field, Mike was introduced to the man of hobbies. Mr. Smith, Sr., was a long, earnest-looking man who might have been Smith in a gray wig, but for his obvious energy. He was as wholly on the move as Smith was wholly statuesque. Where Smith stood like some dignified piece of sculpture, musing on deep questions with a glassy eye, his father would be trying to be in four places at once. When Smith presented Mike to him, he shook hands warmly with him and started a sentence, but broke off in the middle of both performances to dash wildly in the direction of the pavilion in an endeavor to catch an impossible catch some thirty yards away. The impetus so gained carried him on towards Bagley, the Illsworth Hall groundsman, with whom, a moment later, he was carrying on an animated discussion as to whether he had or had not seen a dandelion in the field that morning. Two minutes afterwards, he'd skimmed away again. Mike, as he watched him, began to appreciate Smith's reasons for feeling some doubts as to what would be his future walk in life. At lunch that day, Mike sat next to Mr. Smith and improved his acquaintance with him, and by the end of the week they were on excellent terms. Smith's father had Smith's gift of getting on well with people. On this Saturday, as Mike buckled on his pads, Mr. Smith bounded up full of advice and encouragement. "'My boy,' he said, "'we rely on you. "'These others,' he indicated with a disparaging wave of the hand, "'the rest of the team, who were visible through the windows of the changing room, "'are all very well. "'Decent club bats. "'Good for a few on a billiard table, "'but, but you're our hope on a wicket like this. "'I've studied cricket all my life till that summer. "'It is impossible that Mr. Smith had ever handled a bat. "'And I know a first-class batsman when I see one.' I've seen your brothers play. Oh, you're better than any of them. That century of yours against the Green Jackets was a wonderful innings. Wonderful. Now, look here, my boy. I want you to be careful. We've got a lot of runs to make, so we mustn't take any risks. Hit plenty of boundaries, of course. But be careful. Careful. Oh, dash it! There's a youngster trying to climb up the elm. He'll break his neck. Oh, it's young Giles, my keeper's boy. Hi! Hi there! He scudded out to avert the tragedy, leaving Mike to digest his expert advice on the art of batting on bad wickets. Possibly it was the excellence of this advice which induced Mike to play what was, to date, the best innings of his life. There are moments when the batsman feels an almost superhuman fitness. This came to Mike now. The sun had begun to shine strongly. It made the wicket more difficult, but it added a cheerful touch to the scene. Mike felt calm and masterful. The bowling had no terrors for him. He scored nine off his first over and seven off his second, halfway through which he lost his partner. He was to undergo a similar bereavement several times that afternoon, and at frequent intervals. However simple the bowling might seem to him, it had enough sting in it to worry the rest of the team considerably. Batsmen came and went at the other end with such rapidity it seemed hardly worth while their troubling to come in at all. Every now and then one would give promise of better things by lifting the slow bowler into the pavilion or over the boundary, but it always happened that a similar stroke, a few balls later, ended in an easy catch. At five o'clock the Illsworth score was eighty-one for seven wickets, last man not, Mike not out fifty-nine. As most of the house team, including Mike, were dispersing to their homes or were due for visits at other houses that night, stumps were to be drawn at six. It was obvious that they could not hope to win. Number nine on the list, who was Bagley, the groundman, went in with instructions to play for a draw, and minute advice from Mr. Smith as to how he was to do it. Mike had now begun to score rapidly, 
and it was not to be expected that he would change his game, but Bagley, a dried-up little man of the type which bowls for five hours on a hot August day without exhibiting any symptoms of fatigue, put a much-bound bat stolidly in front of every ball he received, and the hall's prospects of saving the game grew brighter. At a quarter to six, the professional left, caught at the very silly point for eight. The score was a hundred and fifteen, of which Mike had made eighty-five. A lengthy young man with yellow hair, who had done some good fast bowling for the hall during the week, was the next man in. In previous matches he had hit furiously at everything, and against the green jackets had knocked up forty in twenty minutes while Mike was putting the finishing touches to his century. Now, however, with his host's warning ringing in his ears, he adopted the unspectacular, or Bagley, style of play. His manner of dealing with the ball was that of one playing croquet. He patted it gingerly back to the bowler when it was straight, and left it icily alone when it was off the wicket. Mike, still in the brilliant vein, clumped a half-volley past point to boundary, and with highly scientific late cuts and glides, brought a score to ninety-eight. With Mike's score at this, the total at a hundred and thirty, and the hands of the clock at five minutes to six, the yellow hair croquet exponent fell, as Bagley had fallen, a victim to silly point, the ball being the last of the over. Mr. Smith, who always went in last for his side, and who so far had not received a single ball during the week, was down the pavilion steps and halfway to the wicket before the retiring batsman had taken half a dozen steps. Last over, said the wicket-keeper to Mike. Any idea how many you've got? You must be near your century, I should think. Ninety-eight, said Mike. He always counted his runs. By Jove, as near as that. That's something like a finish. Mike left the first ball alone, and the second. They were too wide of the off stump to be hit at safely. Then he felt a thrill as the third ball left the bowler's hand. It was a long hop. He faced square to pull it. At that moment, Mr. John Bickersdyke walked into his life across the bowling screen. He crossed the bowler's arm just before the ball pitched. Mike lost sight of it for a fraction of a second and hit wildly. The next moment, his leg stump was askew, and the hall had lost the match. "'I'm sorry,' he said to Mr. Smith. "'Some silly idiot walked across the screen just as the ball was bowled.' "'What?' shouted Mr. Smith. "'Who was the fool who walked behind the bowler's arm?' he yelled appealingly to space. Well, "'Here he comes, whoever he is,' said Mike. A short, stout man in a straw hat and a flannel suit was walking towards them. As he came nearer, Mike saw that he had a hard, thin-lipped mouth, half hidden by a rather ragged mustache, and that behind a pair of gold spectacles were two pale and slightly protruding eyes, which, like his mouth, looked hard. "'How are you, Smith?' he said. "'Hello, Bickersdyke.' There was a slight internal struggle, and then Mr. Smith ceased to be the cricketer and became the host. He chatted amiably to the newcomer. "'You lost the game, I suppose,' said Mr. Bickersdyke. The cricketer in Mr. Smith came to the top again, blended now, however, with the host. He was annoyed, but restrained in his annoyance. "'I say, Bickersdyke, you know, my dear fellow,' he said complainingly, you shouldn't have walked across the screen. You put Jackson off and made him get bold. The screen? That curious white object, said Mike. It's not put up merely as an ornament. There's a sort of rough idea of giving the batsman a chance of seeing the ball as well. It's a great help to him when people come charging across it just as the bowler bowls. Mr. Bickersdyke turned a slightly deeper shade of purple and was about to reply when what sporting reporters call the veritable ovation began. Quite a large crowd had been watching the game, and they expressed their approval of Mike's performance. There was only one thing for a batsman to do on these occasions. Mike ran into the pavilion, leaving Mr. Bickersdyke standing. 2. Mike Hears Bad News It seemed to Mike when he got home that there was a touch of gloom in the air. His sisters were as glad to see him as ever. There was a good deal of rejoicing going on among the female Jacksons, because Joe had scored his first double century in first-class cricket. Double centuries are too common nowadays for the papers to take much notice of them, but still it's not everybody who can make them, and the occasion was one to be marked. 
Mike had read the news in the evening paper in the train, and had sent his brother a wire from the station congratulating him. He had wondered whether he himself would ever achieve the feat in first-class cricket. He did not see why he should not. He looked forward through a long vista of years of county cricket. He had a birth qualification for the county in which Mr. Smith had settled, and he had played for it once already at the beginning of the holidays. His debut had not been sensational, but it had been promising. The fact that two members of the team had made centuries, and the third seventy-odd, had rather eclipsed his own twenty-nine not out, but it had been a faultless innings, and nearly all the papers had said that here was yet another Jackson, evidently well up to the family standard, who was bound to do big things in the future. The touch of gloom was contributed by his brother Bob to a certain extent, and by his father more noticeably. Bob looked slightly thoughtful. Mr. Jackson seemed thoroughly worried. Mike approached Bob on this subject in the billiard room after dinner. Bob was practicing cannons in a rather listless way. "'What's up, Bob?' asked Mike. Bob laid down his cue. "'I'm hanged if I know,' said Bob. "'Something seems to be. Father's worried about something. He looked as if he got the hump rather at dinner. I only got here this afternoon about three hours before you did. I had a bit of a talk with him before dinner. I can't make out what's up. He seemed awfully keen on my finding something to do now I've come down from Oxford. Wanted to know whether I couldn't get a tutoring job or a mastership at some school next term.' I said I'd have a shot. I don't see what all the hurry's about, though. I was hoping he'd give me a bit of traveling on the continent somewhere before I started in. Rough luck, said Mike. I wonder why it is. Jolly good about Joe, wasn't it? Let's have a fifty up, shall we? Bob's remarks had given Mike no hint of impending disaster. It seemed strange, of course, that his father, who had always been so easygoing, should have developed a hustling get-on-or-get-out spirit and be urging Bob to do it now, but it never occurred to him that there could be any serious reason for it. After all, fellows had to start working some time or other. Probably his father had merely pointed this out to Bob, and Bob had made too much of it. Halfway through the game, Mr. Jackson entered the room and stood watching in silence. "'Want a game, father?' asked Mike. "'No, thanks, Mike. What is it, a hundred up?' Fifty. "'Oh, then you'll be finished in a moment. "'When you are, I wish you'd just look into the study for a moment, Mike. "'I want to have a talk with you.' "'Rome,' said Mike, as the door closed. "'I wonder what's up.' "'For a wonder, his conscience was free. "'It was not as if a bad school report might have arrived in his absence. "'His Sedley report had come at the beginning of the holidays "'and had been, on the whole, fairly decent, nothing startling either way.' Mr. Downing, perhaps thoroughly remorse at having harried Mike to such an extent during the Sammy episode, had exercised a studied moderation in his remarks. He had let Mike down far more easily than he really deserved. So it could not be a report that was worrying Mr. Jackson, and there was nothing else on his conscience. Bob made a break of sixteen and ran out. Mike replaced his cue and walked to the study. His father was sitting at the table, except for the very important fact that this time he felt that he could plead not guilty on every possible charge, Mike was struck by the resemblance in the general arrangement of the scene to that painful ten minutes at the end of the previous holidays when his father had announced his intention of taking him away from Workin and sending him to Sedley. The resemblance was increased by the fact that, as Mike entered, Mr. Jackson was kicking at the waste-paper basket, a thing which with him was an infallible sign of mental unrest. "'Sit down, Mike,' said Mr. Jackson. "'How'd you get on during the week?' Oh, "'Topping! Only once out under double figures, and then I was run out. Got a century against the Green Jackets, seventy-one against the Incogs, and today I made ninety-eight on a beast of a wicket and only got out because some silly good of a chap—' He broke off. Mr. Jackson did not seem to be attending— there was a silence. Then Mr. Jackson spoke with an obvious effort. "'Look here, Mike. We've always understood one another, haven't we?' "'Of course we have. "'You know I wouldn't do anything to prevent you having a good time if I could help it. "'I took you away from work, and I know, but that was a special case. It was necessary. "'But I understand perfectly how keen you are to go to Cambridge.' I wouldn't stand in the way of that for a minute if I could help it. Mike looked at him blankly. 
This could only mean one thing. He was not going to go to the varsity. But why? What had happened? When he left for the Smith's cricket week, his name had been down for King's, and the whole thing was settled. What could have happened since then? But I can't help it, continued Mr. Jackson. Aren't I going up to Cambridge, father? stammered Mike. I'm afraid not, Mike. I'd manage it if I possibly could. I'm just as anxious to see you get your blue as you are to get it. But it's kinder to be quite frank. I can't afford to send you to Cambridge. I won't go into details which you wouldn't understand, but I've lost a very large sum of money since I saw you last. So large that we shall have to economize in every way. I shall let this house and take a much smaller one. And you and Bob, I'm afraid, will have to start earning your living. I know it's a terrible disappointment to you, old chap. Oh, th that's all right, said Mike thickly. There seemed to be something sticking in his throat, preventing him from speaking. If there was any possible way. No, no, it's all right, father, really. I don't mind a bit. It's awful rough luck on you, losing all that. There was another silence. The clock ticked away energetically on the mantelpiece, as if glad to make itself heard at last. Outside, a plaintive snuffle made itself heard. John the Bulldog, Mike's inseparable companion who'd followed him to the study, was getting tired of waiting on the mat. Mike got up and opened the door. John lumbered in. The movement broke the tension. "'Thanks, Mike,' said Mr. Jackson, as Mike started to leave the room. "'You're a sportsman.'" Three. The new era begins. Details of what were in store for him were given to Mike the next morning. During his absence at Illsworth, a vacancy had been got for him in that flourishing institution, the New Asiatic Bank, and he was to enter upon his duties, whatever they might be, on the Tuesday of the following week. It was short notice, but banks had the habit of swallowing their victims rather abruptly. Mike remembered the case of Wyatt, who just about the same amount of time in which to get used to the prospect of commerce. On the Monday morning, a letter arrived from Smith. Smith was still perturbed. Commerce, he wrote, continues to boom. My painter referred to Comrade Bickersdyke last night as a merchant prince. Comrade B and I do not get on well together. Purely for his own good, I drew him aside yesterday and explained to him at great length the frightfulness of walking across the bowling screen. He seemed restive, but I was firm. We parted rather with the distant stare than the friendly smile. But I shall persevere. In many ways, the casual observer would say that he was hopeless. He is a poor performer at bridge, as I was compelled to hint to him on Saturday night. His eyes have no animated sparkle of intelligence, and the cut of his clothes jars my sensitive soul to its foundations. I don't wish to speak ill of a man behind his back, but I must confide in you as my boyhood friend that he wore a made-up tie at dinner. Oh, but no more of a painful subject. I'm working away at him with a brave smile. Sometimes I think that I'm succeeding. Then he seems to slip back again. However, concluded the letter, ending on an optimistic note, I think I shall make a man of him yet, some day. Mike reread this letter in the train that took him to London. By this time, Smith would know that he was not the only case in which commerce was booming. Mike had written to him by return, telling him of the disaster which had befallen the house of Jackson. Mike wished he could have told him in person, for Smith had a way of treating unpleasant situations as if he were merely playing at them for his own amusement. Smith's attitude towards the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune was to regard them with a bland smile, as if they were part of an entertainment got up for his express benefit. Arriving at Paddington, Mike stood on the platform, waiting for his box to emerge from the luggage van with mixed feelings of gloom and excitement. The gloom was in larger quantities, perhaps, but the excitement was there, too. It was the first time in his life that he had been entirely dependent on himself. He'd crossed the Rubicon. The occasion was too serious for him to feel the same helplessly furious feeling with which he had embarked on life at Sedley. It was possible to look on Sedley with quite a personal enmity. London was too big to be angry with. It took no notice of him. It didn't care whether he was glad to be there or sorry, and there was no means of making it care. That's the peculiarity of London. 
there's a sort of cold unfriendliness about it. A city like New York makes the new arrival feel at home in half an hour, but London is a specialist in what Smith in his letter had called the distant stare. You have to buy London's goodwill. Mike drove across the park to Victoria, feeling very empty and small. He'd settled on Dulwich as the spot to get lodgings, partly because, knowing nothing about London, he was under the impression that rooms anywhere inside the four-mile radius were very expensive, but principally because there was a school at Dulwich, and it would be a comfort being near school. He might get a game of fives there sometime, he thought, on a Saturday afternoon, and in the summer, occasional cricket. Wandering at a venture up the asphalt passage which leads from Dulwich Station in the direction of the college, he came out into Acacia Road. There's something about Acacia Road which inevitably suggests furnished apartments. A child could tell at a glance that it was bristling with bed-sitting rooms. Mike knocked at the first door over which a card hung. There is probably no more depressing experience in the world than the process of engaging furnished apartments. Those who let furnished apartments seem to take no joy in the act. Like Pooba, they do it, but it revolts them. In answer to Mike's knock, a female person opened the door. In appearance, she resembled a pantomime dame, inclining towards the restrained melancholy of Mr. Wilkie Bard, rather than the joyous abandon of Mr. George Roby. Her voice she had modeled on the gramophone. Her most recent occupation seemed to have been something with a good deal of yellow soap in it. As a matter of fact, there are no secrets between our readers and ourselves. She had been washing a shirt. A useful occupation, and an honorable, but one that tends to produce a certain homeliness in the appearance. She wiped a pair of steaming hands on her apron, and regarded Mike with an eye which would have been markedly expressionless in a boiled fish. "'Was there anything?' she asked. Mike felt that he was in for it now. He had not sufficient ease of manner to back gracefully away and disappear. So he said that there was something, in point of fact, he wanted a bed-sitting room. "'Bark upstairs,' said the pantomime dame, which Mike interpreted to mean, would he walk upstairs. The procession moved up a dark flight of stairs until it came to a door. The pantomime dame opened this and shuffled through. Mike stood in the doorway and looked in. It was a repulsive room, one of those characterless rooms which are only found in furnished apartments. To Mike, used to the comforts of his bedroom at home and the cheerful simplicity of a school dormitory, it seemed about the most dismal spot he'd ever struck, a sort of sargasso sea among bedrooms. He looked round in silence. Then he said, Yes. There did not seem much else to say. It's a nice room, said the pantomime dame, which was a black lie. It was not a nice room. It had never been a nice room, and it did not seem at all probable that it would ever be a nice room. But it looked cheap. That was the great thing. Nobody could have the assurance to charge much for a room like that. A landlady with a conscience might even have gone to the length of paying people some small sum by way of compensation to them for sleeping in it. About what? queried Mike. Cheapness was the great consideration. He understood that his salary at the bank would be about four pounds ten a month to begin with, and his father was allowing him five pounds a month. One does not do things en France on a hundred and fourteen pounds a year. The pantomime dame became slightly more animated. Prefacing her remarks by a repetition of her statement that it was a nice room, she went on to say that she could do it at seven and sixpence per week for him— giving him to understand, presumably, that if the Shah of Persia or Mr. Carnegie ever applied for a night's rest, they would sigh in vain for such easy terms. And that included lights, coals are to be looked on as extra. Six pence a scuttle. Attendance was thrown in. Having stated these terms, she dribbled a piece of fluff under the bed, after the manner of a professional association footballer, and relapsed into her former moody silence. Mike said he thought it would be all right. The pantomime dame exhibited no pleasure. About meals, she said. We're wanting breakfast, bacon, eggs, and that, I suppose. Mike said he supposed so. That'll be extra, she said. And dinner? A chop or a nice steak? Mike bowed before this original flight of fancy. A chop or a nice steak seemed to be about what he might want. That'll be extra, said the pantomime dame in her best Wilkie-Bard manner. Mike said yes, he supposed so.
after which, having put down seven and sixpence, one week's rent in advance, he was presented with a grubby receipt and an enormous latch-key, and the séance was at an end. Mike wandered out of the house. A few steps took him to the railings that bounded the college grounds. It was late August, and the evenings had begun to close in. The cricket field looked very cool and spacious in the dim light, with the school buildings looming vague and shadowy through the slight mist. The little gate by the railway bridge was not locked. He went in and walked slowly across the turf towards the big clump of trees which marked the division between the cricket and football fields. It was all very pleasant and soothing after the pantomime dame in her stuffy bed-sitting room. He sat down on the bench beside the second eleven telegraph board and looked across the ground at the pavilion. For the first time that day, he began to feel really homesick. Up till now, the excitement of a strange venture had borne him up, but the cricket field and the pavilion reminded him so sharply of Workin. They brought home to him a cutting distinctness, the absolute finality of his break with the old order of things. Summers would come and go, matches would be played on this ground with all the glory of big scores and keen finishes, but he was done. It was a jolly good bat at school, top of the work in averages two years, but didn't do anything after he left, went into the city or something. That's what they would say of him, if they didn't quite forget him. The clock on the tower over the senior block chimed quarter after quarter, but Mike sat on, thinking. It was quite late when he got up and began to walk back to Acacia Road. He felt cold and stiff and very miserable. That is the end of chapters 1 through 3.